As always, with any salary cap league, there is a focus on how a team goes about spending their money. Some teams in the NHL spend responsibly, signing on depth players for short-term contracts, while other teams take huge swings, throwing their entire checkbook at a player, hoping that they can help bring a Stanley Cup home. Now, these contracts don't always work out the way we anticipated, so in this video, we're going to be taking a look at the worst contract for all 32 NHL teams this season. The Anaheim Ducks, Ryan Strom, four years, $5 million. The Anaheim Ducks made a splash in free agency last summer, signing Ryan Strom to a five-year, $25 million contract as a unrestricted free agent. But his first season with Anaheim could not have been more disappointing. Yes, he did have some points collecting 41, which tied for fifth on the team, but he also had a plus-minus of minus 30, ranking the worst on his team. Strom had a fantastic 2021-22 season with the New York Rangers, so hopefully this is just a result of jitters in a new home and a rebuilding team around him. But right now, it's hard to point at any other player for having a worse contract on the team. And while some might argue that John Gibson has the worst contract given his recent play, he's still starting 50 games a season and it's difficult to pin the blame on him when the defense on the Anaheim team is so poor. It's also just too early to make judgment on a four-year $6.25 million deal handed out to Alex Killorn in free agency, although that is also a questionable deal. But for now, Strom's contract is still the worst. The Arizona Coyotes, Lawson Kraus. Four years, $4.3 million. The Arizona Coyotes general manager, Bill Armstrong, has been making moves and clearing up cap space since taking over the team. In that process, he managed to trade former captain Oliver ekman Larson to the Vancouver Canucks. Of course, Armstrong has added several bad deals to help the team meet the cap floor, like adding Jacob Voracek, Shea Weber, and Brian Little. But among players the team plans to utilize this season, the Coyotes don't have an obvious bad contract, especially after Clayton Keller managed a point per game 37 goal season. But Lawson Krause's deal sticks out as one that is a little odd. Krause is a decent player. He's still just 26 years old and his game may continue to develop. Plus, he's had back-to-back 20-plus -back goal seasons. But so far throughout his career, he has only ever managed to get 45 points in one single season. Most teams would be happy to have him, sure, but for a four-year commitment at a solid cap hit when he has yet to really prove prove himself is not the best deal. The Boston Bruins, Charlie Coyle. Three years, $5.25 million. After having the greatest regular season of all time, no one is really complaining about bad contracts on the Boston Bruins, but there has to be one. Charlie Coyle's contract is hardly one of the worst in the NHL right now, but on a team that has very few notable bad contracts, it still stands out a bit. Now, although Coyle has put up 40 plus points in the last two seasons, he is just a decent middle six player. And at the age of 31, we can see his play regress. A a $5.25 million cap hit on a player who isn't really a clear difference maker is the only reason why I think this is the worst contract on the Boston Bruins. The Buffalo Sabres, Jeff Skinner, four years, $9 million. Jeff Skinner scored 40 goals in his first season with the Buffalo Sabres, and as a pending unrestricted free agent, the GM Jason Botarelli felt like he had to keep his star winger. But the eight-year, $72 million deal he signed always seemed like a steep price for a player whose career high at the time was 63 points. We did see Skinner have a massive bounce back season in Buffalo under new head coach Don Granado. His offensive metrics were off the charts as he had 35 goals and 82 points in 79 games played. It was the best season of his career and arguably justified the GM's faith in him. Still on a team with few bad contracts, Skinner's still feels like an overpay. The Calgary Flames, Jonathan Huberdeau, eight years, $10.5 million. No one could have predicted Jonathan Huberdeau's first season with the Calgary flames would go so badly. Certainly GM Brad Tree Living saw this going a different way when he inked Huberdeau to the richest contract in Calgary Flames history. An 8 year $84 million monster deal. Now everyone knew it was a huge swing at the time but Huberdeau was coming off a 115 point season and the Flames were desperate for some quality players. Unfortunately Huberdeau suffered
suffered one of the most severe non-injury related regressions in NHL history, seeing his point total more than half slash down to 55 points. Only 15 of those 55 points were goals. Huberto ranked 5th on the Flames in points and the team missed the playoffs just one season after winning the Pacific Division. It was a disastrous outcome for both Huberto and the Flames and the only hope now is that Huberto's second season, which will be his first on the new contract, is a return to form so he can bring the Calgary Flames back into the playoffs. The Carolina Hurricanes, Brent Burns, 2 years, $5.28 million. In acquiring Brent Burns in the offseason, the Carolina Hurricanes added a big defenseman with a bigger personality. But they also brought in a big contract and clearly the worst of the books on such a cap conscious team. Burns still produces points and had a fantastic season in Carolina, but at 38 years old, his best days are certainly behind him. Some might point to Jesperi Kokanayemi's long contract and low point total as an option, but he is a highly valuable defensive forward and is just 22 years old. Although Burns still has value in the league, his is definitely the worst contract. The Chicago Blackhawks, Seth Jones, 7 years, $9.5 million. The Chicago Blackhawks' decision to sell the farm and acquire Seth Jones when they did was a very risky move. Their choice to immediately give him an 8-year, $76 million contract extension was outright confusing. And now that they're in the middle of a rebuild where Jones is one of two non-rookies with a contract that extends beyond the 2023-24 season, it is undeniable that Jones' extension was a huge mistake. It's not that he's a bad player. His stats actually graded him as a plus defender last season, but he is not worth that contract on any team. Now, the Blackhawks are fully in their Connor Bedard era and are unlikely to compete for the next few years in the league. But as for Jones, he will still be around during Connor Bedard's prime, and by then, his large contract will certainly be an issue for the team. The Colorado Avalanche, Miles Wood, 6 years, $2.5 million. The Colorado Avalanche are in a tough spot. They have the blessing of employing several of the league's top superstars, including Nathan McKinnon, who will be the league highest paid player this season and of course you cannot forget about Kale McCarr. Before long they'll need to give long extensions to one or both of Devin Taves and Bowen Byram. As a result of those salary cap commitments it makes sense that they would play around with the margins and do some unique things to build a competitive team while keeping the costs low. But that doesn't really quite explain the six year 15 million dollar contract they gave Miles Wood. With all due respect to Wood he's the kind of player you sign for one or two years at a time. He's a fine addition to your team, but signing him for six seasons doesn't make any sense under any circumstances. The Columbus Blue Jackets, Elvis Merz-Lincolns, four years, $5.4 million. Now the Blue Jackets had an explosive off-season last summer, signing top free agent Johnny Goudreau to a massive seven-year, $68 million contract. Then, after all that hype, they wound up with the second fewest points in the regular season, which, on the bright side, landed them Adam Fantilli. Clearly, the Blue Jackets have issues on and off the ice, off the ice referring to that Mike Babcock drama, but when looking for a reason for the team's performance issues, it's impossible to ignore Elvis Merz-Lincolns. His play during recent seasons has been disastrous, and it's not nearly good enough for the 11th highest paid goaltender in the league. With 7 wins, 18 losses, and 2 overtime losses, with a save percentage of 876 and a 4.23 goals against average, he was one of, if not the worst goalie in the league statistically. Now there is a lot of time and a lot of money left on his contract and hopefully he can turn it around because the future of the Blue Jackets depends on it. The Dallas Stars, Tyler Sagan, 4 years, $9.85 million. It is not often that a player is publicly called out by his team's front office for poor performance, but Dallas Stars captain Jamie Benn and teammate Tyler Sagan have suffered the fate at least twice in their career. In 2018, the team CEO said, what nobody says is what is completely obvious to me. We are getting terrible play from our top two players. If Ben and Sagan don't lead, we will not be successful. Then history repeated itself when the owner reiterated that notion in 2022. He said, when you sign contracts, you have to earn that. The two guys are taking one quarter of the cap space on the team and both of them aren't producing enough. I expect them to step up and get better. In the 2022-23 season, Ben answered the bell returning to form as a star player with 33 goals and 78 
points in his second consecutive 82-game season. As for Tyler Sagan, well, he remained fairly mediocre with 50 points in 79 games. It was a decent season, but was only good for 6 in points among start players. It's simply not good enough for a player making so much money, especially when he's locked in for 4 more years. The Detroit Red Wings, Ben Sherratt, 3 years, $4.75 million. Now there are a bunch of bad contracts on the books for the Red Wings, which is sad to say because they are a team to have yet to find success in recent years. It's difficult to choose the worst out of the bunch. So let's focus in on Ben Sherratt. His performance has been disastrous and it's only one year into his four year deal. This is another one of those deals that most knew was a bad idea when they signed. Sherratt was not a significant enough difference maker for a rebuilding team to make him a big part of their defense. And now they're reaping the consequences of impulsive free agent spending. It's hard to say what GM Steve Eiserman has planned for this team, but this contract is definitely weighing them down. The Edmonton Oilers, Evander Kane, three years, 5.125 million dollars. Now Evander Kane may have had off ice issues but being alongside Connor McDavid, it's hard not to produce points. Initially, this gamble on Evander Kane paid off tremendously. He scored 22 goals and 39 points in his half season with the team and added 13 goals in 15 playoff games. The team quickly signed Kane for a four-year $20.5 million extension, probably thinking they were getting a bargain on a huge asset because of his prior reputation. But it has not panned out so far for Evander Kane. In the last season, he managed to only play in 41 games games, scoring 16 goals and had a minus 4. Now, if he had a healthy season, could Kane bounce back? Absolutely. But it's hard to call this contract extension a success so far. The Florida Panthers, Sergei Bobrovsky, 3 years, $10 million. Now, this is a contract that is tough to evaluate. One can certainly argue that Sergei Bobrovsky is a key reason that the Florida Panthers won the President's Trophy back in the 2021-22 season, and you can argue that he's the primary reason that they reached the Stanley Cup Finals in this past season season. He was electric, winning 12 of 19 games, more than any other goalie. And up until that Stanley Cup final series, he seemed nearly unbeatable until he ran out of steam against the Vegas Golden Knights. So why is he on this list? It's simple. He is still way too expensive for his output. The NHL repeatedly proves that it is almost never a good idea to give an aging goalie a long contract. And the fact that Bobrovsky was outplayed by Aiden Hill in that Stanley Cup Finals proves how fickle the position can be. Hopefully for the Panthers, Bobrovsky has three more decent seasons in him, but even if he does, it's hard to say he's worth the 10 mil for those three seasons. The LA Kings, Drew Doughty, four years, $11 million. Now, no one is questioning Drew Doughty's career contributions to the LA Kings, but at this point in his career, he is not producing anywhere near what he should for someone who carries a cap hit tied for eighth highest in the league and second highest among defensemen. Drew Doughty still logs over 25 minutes per game, which is among the highest numbers in the league. And yes, he still produces points, but his point share, which measures a player's contribution to his team's place in the standings, is down in the 5-6 to six range from career highs in the double digits for three consecutive seasons. Now those numbers are not terrible, they just aren't elite. And an $11 million cap hit is far too high for anyone who is no longer elite. As the Kings continue to evolve into a competitive team again, Doughty's contract can be a roadblock for the years to come. The Minnesota Wild, Frederick Goudreau, 5 years, $2.1 million. Now, in many ways, the worst contracts on the Minnesota Wild are still the twin contracts given to Zach Parise and Ryan Suter in July of 2012. Though GM Bill Guerin finally took the plunge and bought out both players, those contracts will haunt them for years to come, especially between the 2022 and 2025 season, when they carry combined dead cap hits of roughly $12.6 million and $14.6 million that will effectively cripple the team in free agency, the trade market, and contract extension talks. But looking past contract buyouts, the far worst active contract on this team is the newly signed Frederick Goudreau, who signed a 5-year, $10.5 million contract in April. It's not that Goudreau has been a bad player for the Wild. In fact, he reached a career-high 19 goal mark in the 2022-23 season, shortly before signing this contract. 
the contract is just a bit of a head scratcher. A five-year commitment to a 30-year-old player really feels out of place. In fact, Garen is probably trying to solve his cap dilemma by signing a long-term contract to a lower cap hit. It's just worth questioning whether Goudreau was the right player for that commitment. Either way, the commitment was made and Goudreau will be a wild player through to the 2028-29 NHL season. The Montreal Canadiens, Josh Anderson, four years, $5.5 million. Unfortunately for the Canadians, they have a number of contenders to make this list. They can bury the massive contract of Carey Price on the LTIR for as long as they need to. And then there's Nick Suzuki, but you have to bet that Suzuki will have a bright future ahead of him. The same cannot be said for Josh Anderson, who is entering his fourth season of a seven-year, $38.5 million contract he signed with the Canadians in 2020. Montreal signed him just days after acquiring him from the Blue Jackets, and they received criticism for giving him such a long, expensive contract to a player who has only one season of over 30 points in his career. After three seasons with the Canadians, this gamble clearly has not paid off. Anderson continues to struggle to stay healthy and has managed only 88 points in his first three seasons with the team. Now the Canadians are in a rebuild, but Anderson's contract may still be on the books when Montreal is once again ready to compete. The Nashville Predators, Ryan McDonough, three years, $6.75 million. The Nashville Predators have to have one of the strangest roster constructions of any team in the league right now. They've managed to add a few key veterans, but are mostly filled with depth players and relatively unknown younger players. It's hard to know whether they are trying to compete or rebuild. In either of those cases, Ryan McDonough isn't much of a force at this point in his career. If the Predators had a bunch of high-level young defensemen in their organization that McDonough can mentor, his presence on the team would make more sense. But at this point, he is just an expensive, aging veteran on their roster. Don't get me wrong, he's still an okay player, but he won't help the Predators compete, and he might just be too good to help them tank. The New Jersey Devils, Andre Palat. Four years, $6 million. The New Jersey Devils wanted to make another big splash in free agency after missing out on the postseason for the fourth season in a row. They came up short in the Johnny Goudreau sweepstakes, but managed to grab Stanley Cup veteran Andre Palat on a five-year, $30 million deal. The good news here is that the Devils return to the playoffs, becoming one of the more dangerous teams in the league, finishing with 112 points, which placed them second in the Metropolitan Division. The bad news here is that Palat was a non-factor, struggling with injuries and only managing 23 points in 49 games played. Now the Devils will hope that this is just a case of bad injury luck. However, the team proved that they don't need Palat to be an impact player to succeed. If he returns to form, they'll be even stronger. But if not, they're paying $6 million a year for a player they can thrive without. The New York Islanders, Kyle Palmieri. Two years, $5 million. When the New York Islanders gave Kyle Palmieri a four-year, $20 million contract extension, some wondered if they were just straight up throwing away their money. His first season with the team certainly didn't change that impression as he finished ninth on the team in points with 33 in 69 games played as he struggled with injuries throughout the season. Unfortunately, the 2022-23 campaign was more of the same deal. It's not that Palmieri's a bad player, but for a cap-strapped team, every dollar counts and his looks like a contract the Islanders really don't need on their books. The New York Rangers, Barkley Goudreau. Four years, $3.64 million. The New York Rangers' decision to sign Barkley Goudreau to a six-year, $21.85 million contract was short-sighted asset management at its finest. Goudreau earned a reputation as a playoff performer with the Tampa Bay Lightning on their powerhouse third line. Goudreau and his line mates Yanni Gord and Blake Coleman all got huge deals that summer, but Goudreau's makes the least sense because of his team's circumstances. Now Goudreau is a solid player to have in your lineup, but his contract is just far too long. The Rangers don't have a ton of salary cap space, especially with many of their good young players requiring extensions in the near future. The Rangers hope that they are still on the rise, but they will soon be cash strapped and Goudreau will be aging and expensive. If they win a Stanley Cup in the next season or two, no one will care. But if they're in year four or five of a pursuit and Goudreau is blocking them from making important moves, then the Rangers could live to truly regret this deal. The Ottawa Senators, Josh Norris, seven years, $7.95 million. The most concerning contract on this roster belongs to Josh Norris. The young center seems to have all the makings of a future star in the NHL, but he is struggling with a persistent shoulder injury that cost him almost all of the 
the 2022-23 season. This is unfortunately not the first injury concern of Josh Norris's career. The Senators signed Norris to an 8-year, $63.6 million contract because they think so highly of his future, but right now, his future seems cloudy. If he remains healthy during the 2023-24 season, then maybe he proves his worth, but right now, he is simply not worth his contract. The Philadelphia Flyers, Rasmus Ristolainen, 4 years, $5.1 million. Rasmus Ristolainen is the archetype of a player that NHL general managers see with completely different eyes than the rest of us. GMs seem to take one look at a 6 foot 4 frame and his physical play of style and get glossy eyed. So even though it was clearly a mistake before the ink was even drying, it is no surprise that a team as badly run as the Philadelphia Flyers signed Ristolainen to a 5 year $25.5 million contract extension. Now the Flyers roster is filled with questionable contracts, like the deals given to Kevin Hayes, Ivan Provorov, and Carter Hart. But in my opinion, those three contracts make much more sense than the Ristolainen one. The Pittsburgh Penguins, Eric Carlson, four years, $10 million. How can the reigning Norris Trophy winner and the offseason's biggest trade acquisition be the worst contract on his new team? Because despite his recent success, Carlson has one of the worst contracts in the league right now. Sure, this may be controversial, and yes, he did have 101 points in the 2022-23 season, but he is the highest paid defenseman in the NHL, and Carlson can simply not play effective defense anymore. He has had a great career and just collected his third Norris Trophy. He's a future Hall of Fame inductee. However, he allowed the fourth most expected goals against and the fifth most high danger chances against at 5-on-5 five five last season. Despite scoring 101 points, he still managed to be a minus 26. The Penguins have an arguable strategy of collecting some of the best veterans in the league and running it back one more time. Newly installed GM Kyle Dubas clearly saw something he liked in Carlson, but Carlson has a lot of wear and tear on him, and there is no question that this is not a contract anyone really wants on their roster. The San Jose Sharks, Mark Edward Vlasic, three years, seven million dollars. GM Mike Greer did the nearly unthinkable in offloading Carlson without sacrificing major future pieces, but he's still got a ton of work to do if he wants to unbury the Sharks from the numerous bad contracts of his predecessors. Vlasic's three years at seven million dollar is a lot better than the $11.5 million they owed Carlson for four more seasons, but it is still way too much for a non-impact player. Vlasic has been a good defenseman throughout his career, but now he is well past his prime, and it looks like the Sharks have a lot of pain to go through before his contract expires. The Seattle Kraken, Philip Grubauer, 4 years, $5.9 million. Do not let the fact that the Seattle Kraken made the playoffs in just their second season in the NHL distract you from the fact that Philip Grubauer has been a horrendously bad goaltender through those two seasons. When the Kraken signed the Vezina Trophy finalist Grubauer to a 6 year, 30 $35.4 million contract, it seemed like a total win. Unfortunately, Grubauer has gone from being one of the best goaltenders in the league to being one of the worst. The Kraken have a fairly strong defense, but Grubauer has managed back-to-back -back seasons with a sub-900 save percentage. His 2022-23 campaign was a mild improvement on the season prior, but it is still not good enough to justify his making of $5.9 million. With a top goalie, the Kraken would be a serious contender, but until they get that goalie, Grubauer will likely be holding this team back. The St. Louis Blues, Colton Pyarko, 7 years, $8.5 million. When the St. Louis Blues signed Colton Pyarko to an 8-year, $52 million contract extension after an injury-plagued season, they were gambling that they were buying a discount on maybe the most explosive position in the league. GM Doug Armstrong saw the deals given to Zach Wierenski and Seth Jones and must have thought $6.5 million per season was a bargain for someone they thought would have been the centerpiece of their defense. Unfortunately, Pyarko has not been the centerpiece, or if he is, he isn't producing enough. The Blues' identity has transformed. Once built on stout defense, they are now a high-octane offense whose blue line struggles to keep up at times. Pyarko is no longer the shutdown D-man he once was, and he does not produce offense like the top best blue liners in the league, which makes him insufficient as a true number one defender. The Tampa Bay Lightning, Mikhail Surkin.
Sergachev. Eight years, $8.5 million. A team that has been to three consecutive Stanley Cup finals obviously is doing something right. So keeping that in mind, it is hard to pick a bad contract on this roster, especially after they traded away McDonough to the Predators in 2022. However, Mikhail Sergachev's eight-year contract extension is a little concerning. No one is denying that he is a great young player, but he is inconsistent and hasn't quite proven that he is going to be a truly elite player. For a team that is usually very careful with contracts and typically gets a pretty steep discount to keep players, the $8.5 million a year the Lightning gave Sergachev seems to be at the very top of the range for a player with his pedigree. The Toronto Maple Leafs, John Tavares, two years, $11 million. There is no question that John Tavares remains a very good NHL centerman, but he carries the seventh highest cap hit in the NHL right now. The narrative for signing the hometown kid who was the most coveted free agent in recent memory was obvious, and Tavares currently has 274 points in 280 games played for the Maple Leafs. The problem with Tavares' contract is his circumstances. The deal undoubtedly drove up the value and the temperature in negotiations with Austin Matthews, Mitch Marner, and even William Nylander. And now, Tavares is approaching the end of his prime, likely to decrease in output substantially over the next several seasons. The Maple Leafs just re-signed Matthews to a contract that will make him the richest player in the league, but they'll still need to navigate the final season on Tavares' contract to renew Marner and Nylander. Tavares' deal has haunted the Maple Leafs already, and those unfortunate circumstances are likely to continue. The Vancouver Canucks, Ilya Mikheyev, three years, $4.75 million. The Canucks chose to sign Mikheyev as a free agent out of Toronto, giving him a four-year, $19 million contract that seems steep to just about everyone at that time. It's unfortunate to say, but this deal could have worked out if Mikheyev had not torn his ACL halfway through his first season with the Vancouver Canucks. Mikheyev's minutes will likely have to be managed this season, meaning that half of his contract will have already been wasted. Even if he gets his feet under him and plays very well for the final two seasons, it's hard to see how the Canucks could possibly recover the value of his contract over time. The Vegas Golden Knights, Aiden Hill, two years, $4.9 million. With Hill, the Golden Knights proved that goaltending in the playoffs really does boil down to having the hot hand at the right time. But then they gave him a hefty extension that pays him like a mid-range starting goalie, even though he just started 71 regular season games over the last three seasons. You could argue that the Golden Knights were just rewarding a major player in their cup championship. However, this contract extension leaves you scratching your head as Logan Thompson will most likely be the Vegas Golden Knights number one goalie this season. The Washington Capitals, Evgeny Kuznetsov. Two years years, $7.8 million. The Washington Capitals are a team in transition. Under normal circumstances, they might rebuild, but with Alexander Ovechkin so close to breaking Wayne Gretzky's once unbreakable goal record, the franchise's attention has focused to helping him reach that mark. Fortunately for them, most of their contracts also play out along that timeline. Only Dylan Strome, Darcy Kemper, and now Tom Wilson are currently signed beyond the end of Ovechkin's contract after the 2025-26 NHL season. So it's hard to say that any of their contracts are really dreadful based on those facts. The one clear exception is Evgeny Kuznetsov. Kuznetsov was once a terrific young player and a key piece of the Washington core. He led the postseason in points with 32 in the year the Capitals won their Stanley Cup. And even as recent as the 2021-22 season, he was nearly a point-per-game player. However, a series of off-ice issues has strained the relationship between the player and team, and no one values Kuznetsov at $7.8 million a season anymore. Kuznetsov can still be a high-impact player, but to spend $7.8 million on a player who just causes problems is certainly not worth it. The Winnipeg Jets, Neil Pionk, two years, $5.875 million. The Winnipeg Jets don't have any truly terrible contracts, but Neil Pionk is not much of a defensive standout as he's making $5.875 million a season for two more seasons. His defensive play in his own end is on the poor side of things and he just simply does not produce enough offense to justify paying him nearly $6 million for the year. Thanks for watching our videos. Don't forget to leave a like and if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button.